GM, GM, and by GM, I mean good afternoon if you're on the East Coast, and good night if you're in Europe. Welcome to the DeFi State, a weekly show brought to you by Hashflow. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Nicole Benham, the host of this show and head of community for Hashflow. On this show, we bring in notable speakers, founders, entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and generally the brightest minds in the industry to discuss what the future of decentralization will look like. What I love about this show is that every guest is so different and has such different insights on DeFi, Web3, and the world. If you're eager to learn and expand your mind, you are in the right place. Also, if you'd like to share this space with your friends, you can click on the arrow at the top right of the space and copy the link, tweet it out to your feed, text it to your friends, whatever works. Um, It appears that our CEO, Varun, has been rugged. He'll be back in a second. This happens a lot. Um, Today, though, our special guest is NFT God, a.k.a. Alex. He runs a Twitter and a popular newsletter on Web3 self-improvement and audience building, one of my favorite follows. I learned so much. Alex, what's good? How are you? I'm doing great, Nicole. Thanks for having me on. It's a beautiful day over here in New York, and I'm I'm really excited to be talking to you today. Oh my God, I'm so excited to be talking to you. I feel like I have subscribed to your tweets, and I feel like everyone just makes me think and inspires me, and I learn so much. Um, I feel like my Twitter feed is better because I learned from you. Um, The first question I have for you you know, because you are tweeting a lot about Web3 and NFTs. What was so special about Web3 that you said to yourself, hey, I'm going to enter this space? Yeah, so I discovered Web3 and NFTs about a year and a half ago. I stumbled across an article on The Sandbox, which is a a metaverse project. I I don't know how I came across it, but I, I was reading it and I was totally blown away. The article is about how in this uh, metaverse, you'd be able to create things sort of like in Minecraft and own it and sell it. And you really own the assets. And I was like totally blown away from, by that concept. I, you know, I never read about NFTs or, you know, the blo- or I knew about the blockchain, but just kind of digital ownership before. And I was so inspired at that moment in time. Like, I just I feel inspired to create content about this. I want to talk about it. I want to get involved in the community. And so I created a Twitter and I created a WordPress blog um, because I was so inspired. Uh, I was like, okay, what name can I come up with that'll really get heads to turn? And NFT God was the first thing that came up to my mind. And so I I took that, I created the Twitter, I I, I bought the domain and uh, I started started writing content from that point because I was so inspired by, by what I found. I love it. And and I certainly saw NFT God and I'm like, who's that? And followed you. So I worked. What were you doing before all this? Yeah, so I am still doing what I was doing before. So I have a full time uh, career that I am involved in outside of Web3. I, I manage a team of technical consultants. I, I still do that to this day because I, I love it um, and it pays the bills. Uh, but before this, you know, I did have side hustles up to this point too. I loved creating content. So actually before this, I was creating content in the traditional finance space. Uh, I was running a Twitter and a blog with a friend. Uh, I was super into, you know, stocks and investing and, you know, I never really quite caught on And before that I actually ran a blog around sports. So I was creating content and tweeting about sports cause I, I'm super into that and none of that ever caught on. But then when I, was looking at the NFT space after I created my account and was looking at, you know, who the, the, the voices were and the thought leaders, you know, I, I made the discovery that, you know, like it, it seemed like 95% of the quote unquote influencers in the space were, you know, meme creators and shit posters, things like that, which, you know, I don't, there's no, pro- I have no problem with that whatsoever. I actually think it's critical to web three culture that that exists, but I saw a gap in the market around kind of, you know, sharing value and helping others, and, and, you know, thought leadership around that. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to try to fill this market gap and, and share helpful content and try to share value and build a platform and share what I learn along the way. So it, I, I transitioned from, you know, the traditional finance space and started trying to fill that market gap in Web3 and it helped me build this platform. 
I love it. Um, value is an interesting word because everyone claims that they're creating it. Uh, they claim that they're sharing it. Um, not everyone is, but how do you sort of define that? What, what, how do you know when you're actually creating value, sharing value, and how do you sort of measure that? Value is obviously different to everyone, but for me, my strategy has always been learn out loud. And what I mean by that is I'm a big reader. I read a ton of books. I take a lot of online courses. I'm, I'm always trying to grow. I, have, you know, I, I believe I have a kind of like a growth mindset. And so my content strategy up to this point, it's been the same way since I had zero followers. And it's the same way today when I have 55,000 followers is just share what I learned. And so as I read books, like you see, I, I share a lot of content on just like general wellness, whether it's meditation or journaling. You see, I, I share content around growing an audience because that's something I'm doing right now. Just everything I learn as I go, I, I share it out to my audience. You know, I hold nothing back. I believe in, you know, the democratization of knowledge. And so when I, when you ask me, what do I believe is value? It's different to every person, but to me, it's, I learn something and then I share it with those around me. And to me, that's sharing value. I love that. Um, it kind of reminds me of like, how I entered the space. I, I didn't know much about NFTs or Web3. I was never really uh, very technical. And I, I was sort of intimidated by the space. But I had to ask myself, like, how can I actually enter this space authentically? And my background was journalism. So I was like, why don't I just be the person that asks questions and I learn as I go along publicly, like that's literally all I do. And I've done it for the past year. And so that was my strategy too. And it works. And the thing is, is, you know, people have that same kind of conversation in their own head. Okay. What can I share? What unique perspective do I have? And a lot of the times, a vast majority of the times they get imposter syndrome. They think, Oh, I don't, I'm not good enough at this to share value with people. Or I'm not good enough at this to, to share my unique perspective. I don't really know too much about any specific thing. So I can't really talk about it. But the thing is, even if you know 20% about something, you're ahead of a vast majority of people. You're ahead of all the people that know 0% about something. So you don't need to be an expert to share knowledge on something. So for you, I'm, you're a journalism expert. I can tell you ask fantastic questions. I've listened to your spaces before, but even if you are new to it and you only knew 20% about interviewing or journalism, you could still share because you're ahead of the vast majority of people that know nothing. And people are willing to listen to other people who even know just 20% about something. Oh, a hundred percent. And also just to add to that, curiosity is value. Um, I remember I used to like study other journalists who were on like 2020, you know, we, we had Barbara Walters, a ton of people, and I was so intimidated watching them. And then I saw like Howard Stern, completely different style. And even Joe Rogan, who sits there sometimes and is like very, he, you can see the confusion and like perplexed facial expression. And he just owns it. He's like, well, I don't understand that. What do you mean? And I'm just like, wow, that that's inspiring to, to even say, like, I don't know something. I don't understand something like it's it's not as intimidating as it used to be. And we're seeing that more and more. So I love that. Um, let's get into NFTs. By the way, Varun, are you are you able to speak uh -huh. now? Uh, let's try. This is a test. <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. I By the way, know. Varun is the CEO of Hashflow. Um, uh, nice to meet you, Varun. Hello, nice to meet you. <laughs> Sorry, I, could, I, I, I was a little rock call at the beginning, so I told Nicole to just start, you know, and I'll join halfway through. Yeah, no worries. Um, so glad you could be here with us, though. Um, I want to get into NFTs because, you know, you tweet about that stuff a lot. Um I liked your tweet, how to successfully market an NFT. I pinned it. It's the second one. Um, if you just swipe, uh, you wrote old way, RT and tag three friends, bought your followers, pay influencers to shill. New way, create con compelling content, extreme transparency, founders in the trenches with the community. Um, can you give us some examples of that? Or like who you think is doing a good job? Yeah, so... It's a big reason why I entered this space and try to create content is because 
when I joined in, I really started tweeting in December of last year. Every project strategy, marketing strategy was the same, right? I'd go on and, and half my feed would be tag three friends, retweet, uh, comment, you know, your wallet address. And like that was the entire marketing campaign it took to make a project sell out. And it drove me nuts. And, and that's the reason why I wanted to create compelling content is because I w- felt like I was surrounded by really low quality, low intelligence content. And, you know, when the bull market ran out, that strategy really stopped working. And you saw some founders who did really well in the bull market still try it and, and it would just keep failing. And then you saw some newer founders. You know, one example that comes to mind is Frank, for instance, the founder of D Gods and Utes. You know, he in the middle of a bear market created one of the most hyped projects of all time and sold out and generated millions and millions of dollars. And he did that solely off of the way he understood the culture and got involved with the community. He was on every Twitter space every day and night for like a month straight. You know, he had his blog where he was talking about the the creative process. He was in his discord talking to his community and doing AMAs every day. And he just had a general pulse on the culture and what people want. And you know what? The the, the Utes doesn't have any utility. Like he hasn't announced anything it does, but it still has this incredible demand behind it just because he ran this incredible marketing campaign where he just clearly demonstrated and, you know, he understands Web3. And to kind of contrast that, you look at what happened with Doodles. Doodles was you know, a top three or four project uh, amongst all projects last year. Uh, it had, it's built out like a corporation. You know, they have an executive board. They have a lot of people involved. They have Pharrell and it's being run really, really, really well. But what's taken it down over the last few months? It went a month without tweeting. And in Web3, that's just like not acceptable by the culture or the community. Like more important than the product itself, more important than what, your product does is if you understand the people you're selling to, especially in web three, and that's just a demonstration of it right there that doodles has taken such a hit just because they didn't tweet. So that's really what inspired the tweet is the old way of doing things is really hurting projects now. And the new way is rewarding founders and holders just because they they understand how web three culture and community works now. I love that. Can we get into culture and community for a second? Like, what does it take to build um, a culture that's thriving and a community that's engaged? Yeah, it's it's a good question. You know, I, I think compelling content, consistent, compelling content is everything. Uh, being able, whether it's memes, right? There's a lot of people, I, I think of Wob, for instance, he's the founder of, uh, of, of the, the SEALs. He just creates very entertaining memes every day and the project's doing well just because he is creating that compelling content and building a culture around memes uh, and his community and just, it's just culture building in front of people, right? And because, you know, I don't want to, you know, dunk on them too much, but, you know, Doodles, they they didn't tweet and so they just weren't cultivating that community or culture anymore and they kind of left it to the holders, So really how you build a culture and a community is your founders and your leadership, as I said in that tweet, need to be in the trenches. They need to be interacting with their community. They need to be holding spaces daily. They need to be in the trenches. And, you know, they got to be able to delegate to other people in the project to do the other work, the artistic work, the product work, the development work. And the leaders need to be the ones in the trenches, you know, leading from the front. 100%. I remember... That's why I got into goblins because of those like nightly spaces they would have with like the guys making the weird goblin noises. I thought it was so funny that I bought into it and I wanted to be a part of it just because of that. However, I did buy at the top and I did, I did lose some money, but that's, that's, that's I tweeted about them a ton because I think they created basically the playbook that's working right now like they were like the first project in the bear market to succeed it was like a few weeks into the bear market everything was tanking and then goblin town came out and they had this really unique interesting strategy 
where they basically did performance art every night in Twitter spaces and their leaders were in there and they got the community involved and they built this wild, unique, interesting culture. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I don't know if like the evolution was there. And I think when they like exposed who they were, it kind of took away some of that mystique. I believe mystique and hype are, are fortunately or unfortunately a big part of NFT marketing. Um, but they, they built a lot of the playbook that works right now. What do you think, what do you think contributes to a project having longevity and evolving to the point that, that they still maintain the hype, the excitement, the mystique, because I feel like a lot of the projects that, you know, you've named here in the space including doodles. And by the way, I love them. I love their events. Um, I love the art. Um, even that, you know, they sort of dropped the ball on their Twitter a little bit. What, which projects do you, you know, do you look at and you're like, wow, I'm really impressed with the way they're running this. And I think this is a long-term play. Yeah. I, I really like the way Artifact runs their ecosystem and, you know, again, what I'm about to say, I don't know if it's the most positive thing in the world. I don't know if it's the most negative thing, but the, just the way NFT marketing works, and it just is what it is, is that you need to constantly have some sort of level of hype and mystery. Like that's just the way NFT marketing works. It, this is not a product focused space. And what I mean by that is a project can release the greatest NFT product of all time. But if they're not marketing it well, it's not going to sell and no one's going to care. But the NFT product could be the worst product of all time. But if they're marketing it well, people will buy it no matter what. Like you look at like loot, for instance. Um, so I like Artifact because they have this way of constantly making their, uh, th their holders anticipate what's coming next. There's always a next thing. There's never like a uh, downtime where you got everything there is and you just kind of wait around. There's always a next thing. They're always teasing and hyping something new. They're always announcing something new. And you look at what they've released. They've released thousands of NFTs, right? They have like 10 different collections, but they've never experienced dilution. And what I mean by that is like, you see a lot of projects where they release their secondary project, you know, like World of Women, for instance, they, they released World of Women Galaxies and it, it hurt their ecosystem. There was a level of dilution there that, happened, that took place that hurt the prices. And I'm not saying the product is good or bad. I'm just saying the way they handled their marketing and, and their product is it felt dilutive and the price went down because of it. But you look at Artifact and they do a really good job of creating mystery and hype. They have these four or five different ecosystems with the sneakers, with the clone X, uh, with the monolith boxes. And you're never quite sure how they tie all together. And you're never quite sure what's coming next. Uh, and they do a really, really good job of cultivating that mystery and hype and making you wonder, oh, I got to hold on to my assets because something new is about to come. I'm about to miss out on something new if I sell, so I can't sell. And it's that, it's that element of hype, mystery, excitement that is the most valuable asset in all of NFTs. Yeah, no, that makes that makes complete sense. Um, I guess the pattern that I've seen is projects are good at creating hype. They're good at creating mystery in the beginning. Once they sell out um, and, you know, sometimes they get called a rug pull, rightfully so because of this, uh, the floor price drops. The founders are nowhere to be found. Um and a lot of them are anonymous too. I mean, even, even me as like an influencer, and this happened to a lot of my friends as well, there have been projects that have reached out, asked us to do giveaways. And at the time, this is like eight months ago, we're thinking, wow, this is like a great offer to our communities. And, you know, these whitelist spots that we're giving out. And I remember doing one, and I, it was like for sure bought it. It had like 40,000 likes, retweets. And then I gained 40,000 fake followers. And literally within two weeks, all those followers were gone. I was like so embarrassed that I did it. I hated it. And the project, of course, sold out. But within two days, 
completely, the floor price completely dropped. And all I kept thinking was, God, I hope these five or anybody who bought that project. So, I mean, someone's ending up holding the bags, but it just was like the worst feeling. And I, I keep thinking to myself after that, I haven't done a giveaway unless I'm like, sure, you know, about the project founders, but I, I mean, I couldn't stop thinking about it after that happened. It's, it's a maturation process for the entire space. It's a maturation process for the, the consumers, right? The people buying the NFTs, but it's also one for kind of the thought leaders and the content creators of the space like you and I, where, you know, this is a, a brand new space. We don't really know what the product is. Is it an investment class? Is it just a collectible? No one really knows. And so it was a brand new space where, you know, now we're being offered money and do I do giveaways? Are they going to rug? We don't know. And, and what's happened is over the last 10 months or so, a whole lot of people have experienced a whole lot of pain for the first time. And that pain is going to teach a lot of lessons. It's going to teach a lot of lessons to, you know, the people who might've done giveaways, who had experienced bots, and it's going to teach a whole lot of lessons to maybe people who bought rug pulls. And they know, okay, now if I see someone doing a giveaway or I see an advertisement for, you know, lazy llamas, or I don't even know if that's a real project, but <laughs> made up project, uh, you know, I'm not going to buy it. Uh, so, you know, it's a maturation. It happened with crypto, right? Like four or five years ago, it was the ICO craze. Everyone was buying every single ICO there was. And a lot of people lost a ton of money. And they felt that pain and now the ICO thing really doesn't happen. And, and you know, we as content creators and, and people in the community had to go through that pain as well. Yeah, a hundred percent. Also something I've been hearing and I don't know if it's true and without mentioning names, I've heard that people are able to bot their spaces too. Meaning like you'll see a thousand people listening to a space, but like, I don't know, 400 of them are fake people. Is that actually happening? Do we know about this? Yeah, that's absolutely happening. Uh, I've seen the the tools that do that. People post screenshots of it. Um, I know some spaces that are, are leveraging that. It's unfortunate. Uh, there is ways to fake anything in this space. And unfortunately, you got to uh, assume, you know, you, you can't trust everyone automatically. There, there's a lot of ways to fake everything you see. Yeah, yeah. That, that was a new one for me. I, I hadn't heard of that until recently. So that was interesting. I want to talk about building a brand. You've tweeted about this. You've tweeted, your brand has the power to make you rich. How does that work? Yeah, content is king. In 2022 and, and moving forward, it's an attention economy, right? And the way you get attention is by creating content and building a platform and building your brand. And the people that are really going to have the most leverage moving forward, especially when the bull market comes back around, is going to be the people with a platform. And hopefully those people with the platform and, and built a strong brand uh, can use it in the right way. You saw in the last bull run, there was a lot of people who use their platform and brand the wrong way and they've disappeared. Uh, but by building a platform and a brand, you create leverage, you create the ability to get your voice out there. And you get the ability to use that voice however you want, whether it's selling products, whether it's building communities, um, you know, whatever it is, your message is able to get out there because you have a brand and a platform. And if you build your brand the right way, you'll get a lot more leverage. If you build your brand the wrong way and, you know, do shady things in the space, you'll, you'll lose that platform pretty quickly and you'll sell out. So um, I'm a big, you know, I'm building my brand. I hope I'm building it the right way. Um, you know, I just, I want to build trust with my audience. I want to build quality content. I want to educate people. Uh, and I believe that that's going to be one of the most valuable assets you can have in 2023 is just a platform where you can spread your message. Oh yeah. That, that's und undeniable. Um, I was listening to the all in podcast and they were talking about the same thing and they mentioned how like any influencer, once they have the audience, the you know, who trusts them, they can sell out anything. I mean, you saw it with Mr. Beast and, and what that burger joint. Did you hear about this? Yeah, I, I did. And, you know, I don't want to, Mr. Beast is one of the, probably the smartest content creator we've ever seen. I, I would reckon that his burger is probably nothing special, but his brand is so powerful that he's making hundreds of millions off it. It's incredible. 
Oh yeah, people tr- people trust people way more than they seem to trust brands. And you know, we just see that time and time again. Who else is building a brand that you that you look at and you're like this person, you know, soon will be able to sell anything or maybe they already can. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting brands out there. Um you know, I, as you said, I think Mr. Beast is the greatest content creator and, and brand uh, architect I've, I've ever seen in my life. He's built this such positive, powerful brand of giving to others. Everything he makes, he reinvests in himself. His vision is completely long term, right? Like he's never he, he's not selling out, really. He's not hurting his brand in any way. He's been doing this for years and his vision has always been long term and building the, the biggest platform possible. Um, and, and so I really admire what he's doing in the NFT space. You know, you look at some content creators like Zeneca, who's really focusing on, you know, bringing value and being positive. Uh, and I, I like uh, what the guys at the Nifty are doing. They, they, they have this really entertaining platform uh, where they're just trying to sh- uh, share value and entertainment as much as they can. You know, and unfortunately, there's other voices in the space who are just here to try to extract as much value as possible. And that's unfortunate. But as long as you're building a brand where you're giving more value than you're taking, you'll be building a powerful brand and platform. I totally agree. Um, who are your favorite people to follow? Who do you learn from? And it doesn't have to be in the NFT space, just anyone that you look at and you're like, this is the type of content you know, I'm, you know, I'm trying to provide or this is who I learned from or wow, I've never seen something like this. That's a good question. Uh, let me let me think about that for a second. You know, I when I created this, I created it because I didn't see anyone else really doing what I'm doing. Um, but I, I do like brands that create content to help other people and there's no secondary uh, there's no secondary motivation to sell something. And I'm looking at someone in the crowd right now, for instance, Chris Cantino, he's in the crowd. He, he tweets a lot about just his view of the market and trends and what he thinks the future is going to be based on his unique perspective of being in the industry for so long. And I, I wish there was more people who created content like that, who provided that kind of unique perspective based on their history I, I unfortunately believe there's too many content creators who just say things to rile people up just to get attention, kind of the, the Kanye West approach. And I think we need less Kanye's and more thought leaders in the space. Amen. Um, I feel the same way about Chris Cantino. Uh, when I see his tweets, they always have value. Um, they're always insightful, always make me think, but also uh, we can't forget track records matter too. And he has a good one. And um, that's something that he has built over time and people trust him because of that, him and his wife, you know? So that's, that's something that people need to take into account that track records actually do matter. And sometimes it's hard because, you know, there are a lot of a non accounts and a lot of anon accounts who have rugged people not that they all do that but just the fact that that has happened so much it's like who are these people coming into the space not sharing who they are we don't know what they've built we don't know their past and we're just sitting here and, and buying into everything they say and then spending money on the projects that they put out and some of them are definitely rugs like that's that's a thing so <laughs> You're right. And it's, it's, I was thinking about this yesterday, like you never see like tech companies who create products who, you know, are trying to go public that have like anonymous founders in the tech industry. If there was ever like a company that their board was all anonymous for some reason, like everyone would call that out question and be like, wait, what are you trying to do? What are your motivations? Uh, And I I understand that web three is a very different culture overall. But it still feels weird that such a large swath of the thought leadership in the space is anonymous. And uh, I just I was watching an interview the other day with someone who has a lot of power and influence in the space. And they were just like blurring out their face in the interview. It it felt so weird. Um, I I don't I just I don't think if you're trying to build a brand that's going to expand outside of Web3 and outside NFTs, 
which I, I think is the goal is to make NFTs go mainstream. I don't know how you can build that brand if you're going to be completely anonymous. The, no one outside of Web3 finds that behavior acceptable. Um, so I think if you're really trying to build a, a global brand, you know, something that extends past this, uh, I, I don't know how you can do that anonymously. Yeah, it's definitely harder. G Money talks about this because he wears his punk over his face in interviews. But, you know, we've all seen him on stage without it. We've all talked to him, gone to an event with him um, or that he threw. So, you know, it's, it's very hard to be completely anonymous. And it's, you know, you definitely question motives when someone is. Um, when did you start your newsletter? What and what is the most impactful part of your social presence? Because you are not, you know, you're not just on Twitter, you you have a sub stack and you an email that goes out to tons and tons of people. Yeah, I started my newsletter when I had zero followers. Um, so I, I, I've had the same sh content strategy from zero followers to 55,000 followers. And, and that strategy is this. Every day since I started tweeting, I, I send out two tweets a day. Every week I send out two to three threads. Uh, and every week I send out one newsletter. And that's been my strategy since I started when I had zero platform at all. And I did it for many different reasons. I, I did it because I wanted to flex that muscle. I, I wanted to build that creative muscle. I, I believe thinking is a muscle and getting ideas out of your brain is a skill set. And so I didn't want to wait until I had a platform to start exercising that skill set. I wanted to do it while no one was noticing so I could suck while no one was noticing. And then once I got the platform, I was an expert and good at it. So I've been sending out, there's actually, when I started, I was sending out a newsletter a day. I'd spend like an hour and a half every night and I'm already working 12 hours a day on my other things. And I would spend an hour and a half, two hours a night sending out my newsletter to a list of under 10 people. And it, it really helped me, you know, synthesize my thoughts, be able to communicate them and be able to form interesting opinions. Uh, Cause I, I also believe just forming opinions is a skill set. And so I liked the newsletter cause it's long form writing. I've always had a hobby for long form writing. When I was a kid, my parents bought me a typewriter and I'm not some like old geezer or something, I'm 32, but my parents are really cheap. So they bought me a typewriter uh, and I would like write stories and stuff on there. And you know, writing's never been my job but it's always been kind of just a passion and a hobby. And so uh, I started the newsletter and I also think it was just a great decision because it grew with me. I, I believe if I never did that and I started a newsletter now where I am, I wouldn't come anywhere close to the growth I've had so far. I have close to 9,000 subscribers right now, which uh, I believe makes it one of the biggest newsletters in the space. Uh, I don't think I'd be anywhere close to that if I started that recently. So uh, I, I'm really grateful to myself that I made that decision. I think that it's benefited me in so many ways, um, both from a having a platform to just having the skills to be able to communicate my thoughts because of the long form writing. Is there anything that you're passionate about um, outside of the Web3 NFT space that you think you'll start tweeting about down the line or sending, you know, including in your newsletter? Yeah, I mean, I, I have a few different areas I tweet on. And I mentioned self-improvement, uh, platform growth, and Web3. I think my content is the intersection of those three areas. There's a lot of other things I'm interested in in this world. You know, I, I'm super into sports. I'm super into fitness. Uh, I'm really big in the tech space. You know, I, I, I manage a team of tech consultants. I'm, uh, I've been a developer most of my life. I do tweet about development sometimes, but I don't believe there's a compelling intersection of those other areas with kind of the, the other areas I have. And what I mean by that is like, I think there's a really compelling intersection between Web3, self-improvement and platform growth, because I think everyone in Web3 wants to build a platform in one way or another. And I believe everyone in Web3, because of the, the, the state of the space, needs to stay balanced in one way or another. This is a space filled with dopamine hits. You know, it, it's arguable, but I, I, I do believe a lot of this is just gambling disguised as investing. 
you know, a lot of people are just buying JPEGs and trading them and just wanting to make a quick buck. And that's, that's not investing, that's gambling. And so gambling in, in these constant dopamine hits are incredibly unhealthy mentally. And so I believe there's a lot of people, whether they realize it or not, needs, they need to think more about balance and more about self-improvement. And so that's why I think a lot of my content around that has been so compelling. So I, I think I found my niches, kind of Web3, self-improvement, platform building. And I think the intersection between those are, are really compelling. There's other things I'm interested in. You know, I kind of experimented with those things when I had a smaller platform and they didn't take off as much. Um, so those are my niches. I'm going to lean super hard into them. You know, if things change, I'm always ready to pivot if other things work. Uh, but that is kind of where I think is I I'm most can authentically relate to and, and provide value to my audience. I want to get in, into the self-improvement stuff. But before that, I want to quickly talk about programming because I saw you tweeted about it. What advantage does it give people to learn how to program, to learn how to code? Like someone like me, for example, or anybody, like what, what advantage does that give us it's a high leverage skill uh so i actually wrote this about this in my my newsletter i sent out about half an hour ago it's a very high leverage skill where you learn it and it does many different things the time you spend in it it does uh it improves your your professional value people who know programming make on average about fifty thousand dollars more uh in their career per year uh it helps you build side hustles. So by learning programming, you can build software that you can sell to people. You can build software that optimizes your workflow, makes things you do quicker. Um, and it also relates to a lot of different fields. So I only have this NFT God platform because a couple of years ago, I started learning Python on the side. And so I was learning Python on the side and I was building Scott stock screeners with the Python. And then I took those stock screeners. I started doing crypto screeners because I was into Bitcoin. And then I, from crypto screeners, I started, you know, getting into, I started hearing more about NFTs, which led to me discovering NFTs, which led to me building this platform. And so it's just a very high leverage skill where you learn it on the side, you learn the skill set, and it branches off and improves so many other areas of your life. And so that's why I tweet about it a lot because I, I really believe everyone should be trying to pick it up. And I also believe a lot of people are intimidated and scared by it when it's really not as difficult as it looks. I, I think people need to kind of work through that fear because there's so many benefits to picking it up. Okay, first of all, sold. I'm in. Uh, second of all, that's how I feel about shit posting. <laughs> as weird as that sounds, like I think learning how to shit post and be funny on Twitter just sets you ahead of the curve. And I learned when I first got on here for years, I had like 4,000 followers. And once I learned how to do that, and I haven't shit posted in a while, which is why I don't feel like anything has gone as viral as my shit posts. But once I started doing that, it opened me up to a whole new world. I started connecting with other shit posters who were big on the app and they would start replying like, it's a vibe. I, I mean, I, honestly, honestly, it, it really is. It, it's Web3 culture. And that's why I said it before, like, I created this account because I saw 95% of people were shit posting, but I still believe shit posting is absolutely critical to Web3. It's the culture. If it didn't exist, the culture wouldn't exist. I believe every NFT and cryptocurrency in the entire world can go to zero. But everyone you talk to on a daily basis on Web3 Twitter, Twitter would still be around because that culture, that shit posting created keeps us together. So, yeah, it absolutely is. I mean, at the end of the day, shit posting is entertaining. It's funny. And the number one rule in life is don't be boring. So if you can be funny and entertaining, then you can naturally get people to gravitate to you. I love it. Okay. Last question before we go. Um in the self-improvement category, what, what, not activity, but what habit do you think will help people the most? Like what has helped you the most that you, that you would recommend 
to anyone and everyone? Like, is it a morning routine? Is it journaling? What is the thing? Yeah, it's two things. It's, and they, they tie together. The first and most important thing is almost all of my good days, the days that I uh, felt like it was successful and I felt good about it. I didn't look at my phone the first half hour that day. And I believe there's a lot of scientific reasons behind that. I believe if you wake up and instantly grab your phone, which is something I did for a long time, and I think it's probably something a lot of people do across the world, you're instantly getting dopamine hits the moment you wake up. And now your brain is going to be in the mode where it's searching for dopamine hits the rest of the day. Okay, so I go out of my way to make sure I do not look at my phone the first half hour of the day. And what I do with that first half hour is I journal. So I, I pull out my notebook and I just free write. I, I write what I want to accomplish that day. I write what I'm proud of from the day before. And I write a few things I'm grateful for. And now that puts my brain in a mindset where I'm looking for things to be grateful for. I'm thinking about my accomplishments. I put myself in a growth mindset instead of being in a mindset where I'm just looking for the next dopamine hit. And so those two habits combined, I think, has the biggest impact on how I view my day at the end of the day when I'm getting into bed. Wow, that is so powerful. The other thing I noticed once I started having like a gratitude practice, it sort of got rid of all, you know, any entitlement that I had. And then I started noticing most people, they either if you're you're either grateful or you're entitled. You know what I mean? You, you either you see what you have as a blessing or you see all the things that you have as ordinary and then you start feeling entitled to stuff. I, I notice it all over um, on social media, in person. It's just it's become so apparent to me. Um, but Alex or NFT God, as I as I whichever one, here, whichever, whichever one. one. Thank you so much for doing this. We'd love to have you back on. For those of you who are here, make sure to follow NFT God. And if you like this show, follow Hashlow for updates. We do this every week. Uh, hopefully we can get Chris Cantino on this show. <laughs> um, but anyway, thank you so much for doing this. And we'll see you next week. Take care, everyone. It was a pleasure. Cool.